I wasn't going to say this, but it's too hilarious. Um, I applied to Hampshire College uh, <laughs> my senior year of high school and didn't get in. So <laughs> that was many years ago. So it's good to finally be here. I want to start by thanking um, everyone who's made this day possible, including faculty and staff, uh, President Jonathan Lash, the Board of Trustees, um, and most importantly, uh, to the students who invited me to come here. Um, I am truly deeply honored. When I received the invitation to deliver uh, your commencement address a few months ago, um, I was very moved. I'm a professor in African American Studies um, I teach at an elite Ivy League university, but I don't consider myself an academic. I have always been an organizer who tries to commu communicate the urgency of our political moment through the lens of history and the concerns of ordinary people. That the graduating class here wanted me to speak to you and your families on this day is validating for my work, and I thank you for that. Now for the catch. I did not attend my high school graduation. I did not attend the graduation ceremonies when I received my bachelor's degree. I've never been to a commencement. <laughs> so I hope I get this right. Let me start by saying that I'm not here to tell you what to do with your lives, but I will tell you what I think is necessary to be in this world that we live in right now. Today is a recognition of the sacrifices that you and your families have made to finish college. But you are graduating into a world of uncertainty and one that is increasingly dangerous. These dangers manifest themselves in a variety of ways. Perhaps the most extreme illustration now resides in the White House. The pro The President of the United States, the most powerful politician in the world, is a racist, sexless megalomaniac. It is not a benign observation, but has meant tragic consequences for many people in this country. From the terror-inducing raids in the communities of undocumented immigrants, to his disparaging of refugees in search of freedom and respite. He has empowered an attorney general who embraces and promulgates policies that have already been proven to have a devastating impact on black families and communities. He thinks that climate science is fake, and his eagerness to take the country into war can only be interpreted as a callous disregard for its steep price in both money and human life. This list could continue, but suffice to say that Donald Trump has fulfilled the campaign promises of a campaign organized and built upon racism, corporatism, and militarism. But we would be remiss to think that the new president has appeared from nowhere, inexplicably, into our otherwise fine democracy. Indeed, it is impossible to understand how we got into this predicament without understanding the deep wells of bitterness, resentment, and anger that have been bubbling beneath the surface of our society for some time. This is not just another partisan battle over race or class decided the presidential election. Rather, it is recognizing simply that the political and economic status quo in this country have failed over and over again to deliver a better way to the vast majority of people in this country. For too long, civility and good manners 
and electoral politics have passed as effective governance, hiding the mundane daily struggles of ordinary people. For too long, the quietude of the status quo has been misinterpreted as indifference to inequality and injustice that pervades our country. For millions of people, the status quo is increasingly intolerable. It gnaws away at the tiny threads that millions of people are hanging on to in their daily struggles to make the ends meet. We live in a celebrity culture that glorifies the rich and famous while ignoring the daily struggles of ordinary people. Their struggles and their lives have been rendered invisible. And imagine if we had a press, a popular culture, or a political class that was curious about the lives of regular people. If we did, what would we find out about the status quo? We would find a deepening crisis of opioid addiction as tens of thousands of people risk and succumb to overdose to escape the uncertainty and pain of life in the world as it is today. The status quo, the status quo is found in the suffocating racism and poverty in Chicago that has created the conditions for debilitating gun violence in city streets that has taken hundreds of black and brown lives. The status quo is found in the shocking reality that life expectancy has declined for working class white women, while 55% of black workers, mostly black women in this country, live on less than $15 an hour in meaningless jobs. The status quo is found in the fact that hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, undocumented immigrants have been uh, 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 deported through raids. It's found when the U.S. military drops something called the mother of all bombs, the largest uh, non-nuclear weapon in the military's arsenal, that we have a media that is more concerned and, and interested in the size of the bomb than in the human lives that have been destroyed by it. That is the status quo. And so it is the normalization of brutality and racism and oppression in our society, so much so that it is expected that we have no reaction to the daily atrocities that are happening in our country. But when our political system, not this or that party, but our political system is led by a billionaire pro uh, president and a Congress that is composed mostly of white men who are millionaires, is it any wonder that many people, most people, have been left behind? Given this reality that becomes more surreal with each passing day, it is easy to be discouraged, but you shouldn't be. Now is the time for defiance. And I don't mean a kind of cheap resistance that is only about voting for a different party in the midterm elections in 2018. By defiance, by defiance, I mean a refusal to accept the world the way it is and instead begin to demand the world that we want. It is the kind of defiance that was on display when three to four million of us around the country rose up to demonstrate the day after the inauguration of Donald Trump in the largest day of protest in the history of this country. But saying no, and even defiance in and of itself is not enough. To win the world we want to live in, and not just changing the guard from a corrupt political party to an inept one, <laughs> there are four things that we need. The first is history. History reminds us that regular people, not the elites, not the wealthy or the well-connected, but regular people have won against more trying odds than those that we face today. We know that some 50 years ago, ordinary black people from across the South, students, sharecroppers, women, boys and girls, garbage men and housekeepers, 
organized and led a struggle to bring an end to racial apartheid in the South. History reminds us that every important progressive reform from the end of slavery to the eight-hour workday to the right to vote and beyond has come from the struggle of ordinary people. And yes, struggle is the second thing. The willingness to engage in struggle is to understand that injustice will not simply wither away because it's bad or because it's wrong. Acknowledging the existence of injustice and oppression is not enough. It must be actively opposed. When Trump's first illegal Muslim travel ban was attempted, thousands of ordinary people flooded the airports around this country. And because of those protests and the defiance they represented, that ban was stopped not once, but twice. It is not enough just to be outraged. Injustice has to actually be defied. Our movements must also be imbued with the spirit of solidarity. What is solidarity? It is the willingness to engage in struggle, even when a particular issue might not affect you personally. Most of the people... Most of the people who went to those airport demonstrations were not personally affected by the travel ban, but they were morally outraged. Solidarity means recognizing someone else's suffering and taking on the burden of fighting to end it or even recognizing it not as a point of difference, but as an opportunity for connection. The revolutionary socialist Eugene Debs spoke most passionately to this when he was being sentenced to prison in 1918 for opposing the First World War. He was going around the country making anti-war speeches. And at his sentencing for sedition, he said to the judge, quote, Your Honor, years ago I recognized my kinship with all living beings. And I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. And while there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. That is the meaning of solidarity. And perhaps most importantly, we need hope. Hope is not blind faith. Instead, it is the deep desire and belief that our world can and should be better and different than what currently exists. Hope comes from having some knowledge of history that we have struggled before and we have won and we can do it again. But it isn't based on knowledge and facts alone. It is also about imagination and dreams. We have never lived in a world of justice, peace, and freedom. We can only imagine what that world would be like. And this is why hope is important. Because in our various movements and struggles, it is all too easy to define what we oppose and what harm we wish to end. But we also have to take the time to think about what it is that we want. And not just as an immediate demand, But fundamentally, what do we want for our planet? What do we want for our species? In 1965, Martin Luther King gave the commencement address at Oberlin College, and he said to the students the following, quote, there is nothing more tragic than to sleep through a revolution. There can be no gainsaying of the fact that a great revolution is taking place in our world today. It is a social revolution sweeping away the old order of colonialism. And in our own nation, it is sweeping away the old order of slavery and racial segregation. The wind of change is blowing, and we see in our day and our age a significant development. Victor Hugo said on one occasion that there is nothing more powerful in all of the world than an idea whose time has come. In a real sense, the idea whose time has come today is the idea of freedom and human dignity. 
Whatever men are assembled to, when, wherever men and women are assembled today, the cry is always the same. We want to be free. And so we see in our world a revolution of rising expectations, the great challenge of facing every individual graduating today is to remain awake through this social revolution, unquote. Within, <laughs> within any social awakening, there are ebbs and flows. Within the last five or so years, we have experienced the highs of Occupy, the Occupy Wall Street movement and the emergence of Black Lives Matter and the he heroic struggle uh, native struggle in Dakota, the Dakota Plains against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And there are many others. But we are now living through the lows of Donald Trump as president. He and his supporters claim to want to make America great again. But what they really mean is they want to take America back to the days when black people were second class citizens, when women had no political voice, and when queer people were in the closet. But going back requires too many people to forget what their eyes have been open to over the last several years. And this is precisely why protest and demonstration matters. It forces the mainstream of our society to deal with and grapple with issues that might otherwise be ignored. Occupy Wall Street helped to create a discussion about structural inequality and poverty in our society. It pushed against the lie that hard work alone is what determines success or failure. It pushed against the dangerous idea that poor people live in deprivation because they are culturally inferior. It gave us the language of the 1% and the 99%. The Black Lives Matter movement has not ended police violence and abuse, but it has certainly gone a long way towards ending the idea that police brutality is just the cause of a few bad apples. The movement broke through the veil of segregation that typically hides the abuse and police, police state-like conditions in working class and poor black communities. Of course, there are those who still ignore or reject black people's demand for justice. But the visibility of the movement has helped to raise awareness and consciousness about the scourge of police violence in ways that were unfathomable even a few years ago. These are only two examples, but there are others that point to the importance of active, visible opposition to not only the autocratic impulses of the President of the United States, but to the everyday systemic violence and oppression that grinds away at people regardless of what party is in office. History, struggle, solidarity, and hope. Unto themselves, they don't guarantee us a better world, but without them, we don't stand a chance. There are never guarantees that we will win in our movements, but really, we have nothing to lose but our chains be they mental, physical, or spiritual. A life of activism and struggle can be exhilarating, frustrating, challenging, but always interesting. Keep reading, keep questioning, listen more intently, and learn from the experiences and mistakes of others. Another world is possible, a world free of racism, sexism, transphobia, religious bigotry, a world free of borders is possible if we are willing to fight for it. Thank you.